Sophie Headley has built an impressive career over the years and has become one of the most renowned names in the fashion industry. She started her career with publications like Tatler, InStyle, and Vogue, where she worked for 10 years as the executive retail editor. After that, she went into communications and PR. She has worked for brands like Selfridges, Armani, and today she is the Today, Sophie is the communications and PR director of Value Retail, which is a company that is the only company that specializes in luxury outlets in the world. So many of you might know Bista Village. Um, so if you go to London, like most people go to Bista Village for a good discount. So they do Bista Village and other companies in Europe and across the world. Without further ado, please welcome Sophie Headley to the stage. Hi, Sophie. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, I'm Thank just going to give you the floor. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, everybody. And great to see so many of you here on such a rainy day, something unexpected here in Nigeria, I'm sure. Um, it's my first visit, and um, I'm incredibly excited to be here, so thank you for having me. And, uh, and a big thank you to GT Bank. Um, I think what they're doing here this week is, is really amazing, and I, I hope you all realize how lucky you are. Um, so today, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of, of a journey through, through my career. And um, without wishing to seem narcissistic, I thought it would be useful for a lot of you to understand some of the less sexy elements of the industry, because I'm sure you're all aspiring designers, photographers, stylists, but you know what? There are other elements to consider in the industry. There is communications, marketing, PR, and all of that needs to have a home and somewhere for you to think about in terms of, of your career choice um, that sits under the fashion industry. Now, when I first started out in, in this world, I mean, truly a long time ago when God was a boy, um, I, I knew that I wanted to be in the fashion industry. It was something I felt passionate about. I was crazy for clothes. And my mum and dad despaired. I think they thought at best it was an expensive obsession, and, um, and, and at worst it was a, a distraction from doing something a little bit more meaningful. But I'm here to tell you, you should follow your dreams, and if you feel strongly about something, make it your career. So don't be put off. I started out, as I said, um, as, as, a, as a lowly 19-year-old, uh, and I, I went originally to, to work on the shop floor. I worked as a receptionist. And I did all sorts of very um, menial jobs before I finally uh, made my first job at Condé Nast. And I hounded the poor HR department there, literally on a weekly basis. And you have to remember, this was before the mobile phone, this was before email. So I hand wrote letters to the HR department and said, you've got to employ me, I really want to come and work at Condé Nast. And finally, I, um, they relented, I think partly because they wanted me out of their hair. And I took a role as a PA for the chairman and the managing director. I was a junior PA and a really rubbish one at that. Um, I, I was hopeless at shorthand and, um, and thankfully I managed to move on from there. So I'm going to take you through, through my journey um, with, these, with these slides and tell you a little about where I am now. So Tatler, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not a magazine that you're perhaps so familiar with. It's, it's got quite a, a small readership, but it's the oldest magazine within the Condé Nast stable. And uh, it's, it's now edited by uh, a lady called Kate Reardon. She and I were in the fashion department when I, when, when I joined there. And, um, and I also had the luck to work with Natalie Massenet, who of course went on to become the founder for net a um, and, and Claudia Winkleman, who's now a bit of a, a TV star um, in the UK. So you never know, from small acorns, big oak trees can grow. Um, I then moved to Vogue, and that was an exciting time in my life. Um, I would still say possibly one of the happiest memories that I have. I spent 10 years at Vogue, and I had a role that sat 
between advertising and editorial. So I had pages within the magazine that talked about um, little sort of soundbite pieces, shops that were opening, accessories. I hosted events on behalf of the magazine. And, um, and I think Vogue is, is, is a funny place. People often ask, you know, what it's like to work on a title like that. And, um, and Vanessa's going to have all that joy ahead of her um, when, she, when she gets there in January. It's, there's something rather reassuring about working for the Fashion Bible. And um, I used to host seasonal trends and talk to people within the industry about what the trends for the next season would be. And um, as I say, all of this was ahead of the digital age. So if you were an advertiser, you might well want to use the Vogue database in order to drive footfall to your stores. And I would be your girl to help that happen. However, magazines are going through an enormous change at the moment. And I think it's fair to say, much like retail, uh, you need to have clicks and bricks, and, um, and in magazine world you need to have paper and digital because one feeds off the other. I was talking backstage to um, some, of the, some of the key um, guests only earlier today and I said, you know, do you, do you read magazines? Who reads magazines anymore? And, um, and the unanimous vote was, yes, magazines at the weekend, digital midweek. And I'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate to that. I then moved to InStyle magazine, more money, bigger job, who wouldn't? Um, um, magazine is the biggest uh, glossy title in America, and it opened in the UK amidst much fanfare, and it really pioneered this idea of having um, still life images, flat shot, which sounds very basic now, but um, I'm going back a few years. And um, sadly to say that this magazine printed its last issue in October 2016, and uh, it's, it's now digital only. From InStyle, I was headhunted to go and work for Mr. Armani. And I think what I'm keen to point out to you all is that you may have an ultimate goal and desire for where you want to be, but sometimes you need to take quite a zigzagged route to get there. And, um, and if I'm honest, I, I never really had a, a long-term long goal plan in mind. Um, I've just seized whichever opportunity has come my way. And Armani is, let's face it, uh, the biggest and the most successful fashion brand in the world, privately owned. Uh, he's an impressive man, terrifying to work for. Um, I was flown to Milan for my interview and he kept me waiting for hours and hours. So by the time I got to meet him, I was such a bundle of nerves, I could barely speak. And, um, and I was told he didn't speak English. So um, I'd been having secret lessons, uh, French lessons, going through what sort of potential questions he might ask so that I didn't appear a complete idiot. Um, and somehow I, I got the role. So Mr. Armani, uh, was born in uh, 1934, the middle of three children, and um, he's now well into his 80s, although you wouldn't know it because he's very well preserved. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, he started out um, in the military service and then went to work for an Italian department, school, uh, an Italian department store called La Rinascente, which is still going strong to this day. And he formed the label only as recently as the 1970s. Now, looking around the room, you probably weren't born in the 1970s, but trust me, that feels relatively recent when you consider how big his empire is nowadays. Uh, and he has grown this, this business quite extraordinarily, from uh, obviously from couture to ready-to-wear, right through to underpants, hotels, and restaurants. Uh, so, truly a remarkable achievement in, in one lifetime. I think it's fairly safe to say that he pioneered celebrity dressing. So, all those years ago, with, with actresses that were up and coming, such as Jodie Foster, and to this day, a lot of the, the die-hard uh, red carpet actors and actresses all want to wear Armani. And so, whether it's Lady Gaga, whether it's Rihanna, he's, he's dressing them all. 
Now, when I was there, um, we, had, uh, we had the pleasure of, of dressing the, the Chelsea football team. And I'm sure you're all keen football fans. And um, there's, an, there's an age old English expression which is never work with children or pets. And I would like to add to that football players because um, they are without doubt the most impossible, um, very charming, but the most impossible people to work with. They would regularly leave, you know, whole bags of suits and clothes in the back of taxis and cars and forget where they left everything. Um, but it was, it was very entertaining and uh, they came as part of the contract to the Brompton Road store to do a charity evening and, um, and obviously there was the boxes which, which come and visit uh, the matches which, which my husband particularly enjoyed. Uh, one of the things I was, I was most proud of that working for Armani was uh, to help launch the underwear collection modelled by David Beckham, keeping with the football theme. Now, um, you may have seen these images. They really went global. Uh, they were photographed by Merton Marcus, the incredible um, photographic duo, and, um, and they caused quite a scene. And when I went to visit the CEO and the managing director for Selfridges and said, this is what we'd like to do. We want to stop the traffic on Oxford Street and we would like David Beckham to reveal a poster of himself in his underpants. There was a deathly silence in the boardroom at Selfridges and they said, you must be joking. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm really serious. Anyhow, um, I'm glad to say we pulled it off and, um, and it was extremely entertaining and the pictures went viral. And I think it's important to remember that you need to do interesting things within the retail sector to create that talkability, to create that theatre and drama. Because let's face it, you can buy Armani underpants pretty much anywhere. So you need to make sure that wherever you are, it's going to be to get them. Having left Mr. Armani, I was asked to go and work at Selfridges. They obviously like the underpants um, theme. And uh, I was there as head of PR. And I'm sure you're familiar with Selfridges. It's a huge department store in Oxford Street. There are two in Manchester and there's one in Birmingham as well. It's privately owned by the Weston family, a very, um, a very private uh, Canadian family who have fingers in all sorts of retailing pies. And it's the second largest department store after Harrods. Um, it was launched in uh, 1909 by Harry Gordon Selfridge who was uh, an extraordinary pioneer of his day and um, created something extraordinary. But, but sadly, he, he lost, his, he lost his, his wealth to wine, women, and song and, and um, is buried in a pauper's grave. But there was a big TV series uh, in the UK that was incredibly popular, um, all about Harry Gordon Selfridge. Uh, it was bought by, uh, by the Western family from the Sears Group in uh, 2003. And the Western family invested a lot of money into the bricks and mortar to make it what it is today, um, a truly exceptional retail experience. And one of the things I wanted to explain to you, as I said, about retailing and theatre is to bring those two together and what makes it sing is the way you can bring the clothes to life. And uh, the clever buying team, and Rebecca will remember this, having, having worked there, were always quick to negotiate deals with designers. So for those of you who are aspiring designers out there, you have to do more than simply create beautiful clothes. You, you need to be the face, the voice, and the life and soul of your brand. And here, uh, we, uh, we launched uh, House of Darien, which was the fashion brand created by Beyonce. She came to Selfridges. We turned over the car park into a, a catwalk, and she came with her mum. She was newly pregnant. It was very exciting. And um, it created a huge buzz. Millions and millions of pounds worth of PR coverage for the store and for her brand. And that's the sort of thing that really will help cement uh, designer and brand relationships with retailers. Other 
quirky things that, um, that were done within the, the retail sector was to support Wool Week, um, a strange little quirky uh, theme. As you can imagine, all of us Brits love our animals. Um, you probably know we're a bit crazy for, for our cats and dogs and, and, of course, sheep as well. And Wool Week is uh, a great week that, that really um, promotes the use of wool as a natural fibre. And so we brought a herd of sheep that were dip dyed, Selfridges Pantone Colour Reference 109, with vegetable dye, I may add, so it, was, it wasn't cruel. Um, and we created a little bit of a buzz with this uh, image, and, um, and the, again, the pictures went everywhere. Project Ocean is, um, is something very close to Alana Weston's heart. And as a department store, it's great that um, they have such a, a key interest in sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And uh, Project Ocean was very much about reviewing the oceans of the world and really appreciating the diminishing supply of fish. And so the entire food hall was, was scrutinized and any fish that was not sustainable was taken out of the store and uh, I think you'll find to this day all the food is very much um, sustainable within Selfridges and His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales came to give a talk on, on this matter and there was a, a, a marine conservation area in the Philippines created by the Western family uh, specifically for, um, for helping to put the ocean's um, fish back in the sea. I hosted uh, various conversations with designers to help drive sales. On the left you can see um, I'm having a chat with Roland Murray, very handsome. He looks like a matinee idol if any of you have met him. And it was interesting to see that all the ladies who came to this particular evening, they, they bought a Roland Murray dress to meet him and then they bought another one because they so fell in love with him. So again, what's not to love about that? Mary Katranzu, um, who interestingly makes these beautiful, crazy prints, and yet she wears black um, from head to toe. Uh, she is, she's a British designer, but of Greek origin. Um, and again, we, we brought her to, to Manchester to, to show her a good time. One of the things that I think is important to understand is it's, it's the theatre, but it's also the environment in which you sell. So making sure that your boutique looks fantastic, and the lighting is good, and the ceilings are nice and high, and there's natural light. Uh, all of these elements are super important, and, um, and the family invested a lot of money, firstly in shoe galleries, uh, and then in the designer galleries, and of course, the denim studio. Now, after Selfridges, I moved to mywardrobe.com, and um, I took a little bit of a breather. I ran the London Marathon and I did a little bit of consultancy for uh, an, a venture capitalist called Mark Aziri. And I did three days a week at mywardrobe.com. Uh, this was a well-known site in the UK. And um, what was interesting about it, it, from my point of view, being an old dinosaur and coming to the digital age, perhaps slightly later in life, was, was to really see and appreciate how expensive this model is. So you have to bear in mind, you have a buying team to buy the clothes, you have an editorial team to create interesting content for the site, you have all the storage costs and overheads um, because the clothes need to live somewhere. That's notwithstanding all the postage and the returns that need to happen because invariably people buy too much or they get the wrong size. And it, it was an extremely expensive um, model to sustain and ultimately it was bought out by the net porte group and I think it's fair to say that there are far fewer digital e-tailers now because it's survival of the fittest and it's really got to be the big boys that um, that stick together so from from my year taking a, a slightly different route I decided to go back into retailing something safe, something perhaps a little bit more, um, more assured. Um, and for personal reasons, my life meant that I was based in Oxfordshire. And for those of you that aren't familiar with, with Bista Village, it's, um, 
it's an incredible success story. It uh, opened 22 years ago um, in a small field called Pingle Field in, in Oxford. And the brains behind it was a gentleman called Scott Malkin. And today it's a, a billion dollar business. There are nine villages in Europe and there are two in China, one in Shanghai and one in Suzhou and truly just finished expanding for the fourth time. So I'm going to show you a small video now because it gives you a better understanding of who we are at Valley Retail and what we do. I'm just going to explain a little bit more about, about what we do because um, that gives you an overview of fashion and tourism and I think it's fair to say that as, as the world is a smaller place and we all travel so much more, um, you want to find that great shopping experience wherever you go. And um, the great thing about Vista Village is that we are literally under an hour from London and everything is discounted throughout the year. Um, and so you will find some exquisite brands, all of whom are between 30 and 60% off at any one time. So a little potted history about um, Bista, Bista Village. As I said, we're 46 minutes from Marylebone. Um, and we call ourselves both a fashion and a tourism destination, uh, which makes us uh, very different from, from any other kind of um, retailing experience. Uh, we're not, we don't call ourselves an, an outlet center. Um, we're more luxurious than that. The brands that we have are, are really super top-end designer brands. Uh, we expanded literally two weeks ago, earlier in October, um, as I mentioned, with 30 more boutiques. And um, the village now has uh, hands-free shopping, we have valet service, uh, we have bellboys and girls to help you with your luggage. And um, we, we welcome everybody from across the world. We have 50% of our visitors are overseas. 
the new Bista Village, um, our fourth incarnation, as I say, opened a couple of weeks ago with new brands such as Acne Studios, Joseph, Under Armour, Ola Bar Brown, uh, Roxander, and Christopher Kane. And there's also a, a delicious new restaurant. Every year we like to have some kind of interesting pop-up and to celebrate Christmas, we've got a gifting pop-up, which has been designed by Luke Edward Hall. He's rather a, a quirky character. He looks a bit like Harry Potter. And um, the store is all bright red, and it's full of gifts for Christmas, which is great for our domestic audience, but it's also great for the overseas visitors who want to bring something quintessentially British back home. The apartment is um, a new concept. It's a beautiful, luxurious space designed by Carden and Concinetti, and it's a place where we can host trunk shows uh, and where we can have a, a more intimate gathering for breakfasts or lunches and private dinners. Uh, so something uh, for, for, the, for the big spenders to enjoy. These are just some of the other brands that we, we have from Prada and Celine and Gucci. Um, no reason not to come, ladies and gentlemen. The location is suitably close to Oxford, so whether you want to have a, a lovely weekend away, enjoying some of the more academic uh, hotspots, you can do that and catch the train. And the train from London, as I say, is, is incredibly easy. Some of the celebrities that we've welcomed over the years include the Duchess of Cambridge, Jensen Button, Jemima Khan, Mary Portis. Uh, some people like to, to shop on the quiet. They don't necessarily like to, to say that they've been buying uh, designer brands for less. Others are happy to shout it from the rooftops. We don't care, just as long as they shop. And um, from a digital influencer point of view, this is an area that we are looking to invest more and more time and money as we see uh, the importance that they have and the reach that they are able to, to talk to. So we work with all sorts of digital influencers across the globe from China and the UEA and, um, and I hope we'll be able to encourage some from, from Nigeria, who knows. Some of the PR and events that we've, we've hosted um, include the British Designers Collective. I'm wearing a, a dress that was um, from a, a couple of years ago, actually, designed by a, a Korean designer called Udon Choi. And last year, we had a, a British Wool Collective pop up. And we invited Alex James, who is uh, the singer for Blur. He lives nearby. He has lots of sheep in his fields. And he provided the British fashion press with lots of smelly cheese to go home with. And the point is, with that story, um, that it provides something that's quintessentially British, something that's different. And you know that net porte and Westfield and Harrods sure as hell aren't going to give the press uh, a smelly cheese and a good time in Oxford. Some of the other pop-ups that we've hosted include Bamford and Marnie. Uh, we currently have Charlotte Tilbury in the village and, um, and Clive Christensen as well. We've had some, some great PR, I'm proud to say, um, from editors such as Lisa Armstrong, and, uh, and in the FT, uh, WWD, uh, there's been a whole plethora of coverage, including Grazia and China Morning Post, all covering uh, what we do. And finally, uh, a, a visual, an overhead visual from the new part of the village and a quote from Lucia van der Post, who came to our Christmas press day. Um, and she, she's been a die-hard fan since the early days, 22 years ago, when we first launched. So it's nice to know that we have, we have keen fans in, in the press who are always keeping an eye on us. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much for being such a, a patient audience and happy to take questions. Hi, hi Sophie, how are you? Good, I hope thank you're enjoying you. Nigeria. And I hope you like our weather, like the British weather, really. Anyway. <laughs> I brought the English question. weather with me. <laughs> okay, my name is Adikule. I want to presentations. You know, I love your presentations. Well presented. Now, how do you deal with the issue of sexual molestation and harassment in the fashion industry, in light of what is going on in Hollywood now? You know, you, you, you're pretty. I don't know. I don't know your age, but you know, it's a dog, each dog word in the fashion industry. Female models and female designers need to 
compete, and you know, most of the management in the fashion industry are dominated by male, by male and men. So how do you cope? How is that curtailed in Europe and in England, where you come from? Do you know, I've, I've been lucky enough not to come across that in, in my personal experience. Um, so I, I, I can't honestly give you any, any point of view. Uh, I think it's fair to say that everybody is much more mindful and respectful nowadays, and there are many more um, laws in place. Uh, so it, it's, it's something that's, that's clearly a hot topic at the moment, um, but, but, but I've, I've been lucky not to come across that to date. You're welcome, um, Madam, to Nigeria. I've gone to Bista myself, and really, as you said, it's a beautiful experience, just going out into the little cafes and all that. My sister takes me every time I go, and I really do like it. Now, um, I'm running my cousin's company. It's a bridal store. Now, it's a little bit higher end. There are lots of beautiful dresses. She's away for just about five months to have a baby. And I'm trying to get people to come into that beautiful store to have a beautiful experience, but I found it so difficult. So I just wondered how you were able to bring people to a very good product. How do you do that? Because all your yeah. places were higher end. That, that's a very good question. And in, in this day and age, you're quite right. It's not good enough just to have beautiful clothes in a store and open the doors and expect people to come shopping. So um, I, I think nowadays we all have to spend a lot more time teasing the customer to come to your store. And by that, you might easily want to talk to some key influencers. You might want to... Um, give them a, a, you know, an incentive to come to your store. Um, uh, there are rewards programs, there are loyalty programs, there are all sorts of ways that, that, that the customer nowadays is expecting to get added value for, for her money. So um, I, I think you need, to, you need to tease that up and always ensure that there is a new story to tell and there's, there's a point of view. Good afternoon, Sophia, how are you? Good, thank you. I was in one of the self range outlets in Manchester, so you're doing a great job. Oh, <laughs> okay, good. So my question is, um, you know, Nigeria has, you know, when you talk about the fashion industry in Nigeria, you see that a lot of people has promoted the Western brands. I mean, you know, the regular brands like the ASOS, Atmosphere, DNG, name them. But my concern now is, Nigeria is beginning to reproduce, I mean, its own brand in terms of the Ankara skirts, you know, you see the, the blings and the beads and all that. They are looking so nice. How do we promote this local brand in the international market where we could see white? I mean, you go into a, a, a street in London and then you can see 50% of the white people wearing the African brand. So how do we promote this in the international market space? Thank you. That, that's again a, a very good question and it's something that we've touched on in, in various other um, talks yesterday as well. I think there is a huge job to do in terms of um, awareness and export uh, in terms of the talent here in Nigeria um, and, and maybe it's, it's about, um, who knows, doing something more with, with, with GT Bank. Um, uh, moreover, it's it's about ensuring that you've you've got something that is is unique to Nigeria that can be marketed um, in in Europe and in the States. Uh, so it's it, it, there isn't a you know a magic wand that can be waved. It's it's a matter of somebody being bold enough to to seize that that opportunity and and take some of the great um, some of the great. Uh, the, you know, talents here ab abroad, um, but I have to be honest. I'm, I'm not sure how you can harness all that that talent and, and make it global. Um, it'll probably be little steps at a time. Um, my name is Chineze. I'm a fashion designer. What do I have to do to have a store in the village? If I wanted to, what do I have to do? A store at Bista Village, okay. I will be completely honest with you, we are ruthless landlords. Um, and we insist that, you know, there is a certain um, 
there's a certain ROI per square footage. And so a brand needs to be quite well known before it can open with us. However, that said, with our new uh, VIP apartment, there are opportunities to do smaller events in a more intimate environment. Uh, but ultimately, there needs to be uh, brand recognition. Um, so, you know, who knows? You could you could come you could come to Vista Village um, and and host a, a trunk show. That's that's an idea for the future. Hi, Sophie. Hello. Um, are you planning on making a village sometime in Africa, whereby you can bring in African designers or even the European designers? So, are you guys planning to make a village in Africa or even? America, if that's it. Well, I was with our owner last week, actually, and um, we have plans to expand in China first, um, but there, there may yet be um, opportunities in America. So w we'll see, we'll see. It's, it's not, you know, it's not off the cards entirely, but these villages take, take a while to develop. Um, so I'll keep you posted. Please, I want you to widen my horizon. Um, during your experience at um, your time at Giorgio Armani, I want to ask, what's your business relationship like with some other brands coming under Giorgio Armani? For someone like Beyonce who's come to, you know, um, design his own um, product under Giorgio Armani, what's your business relationship like with, um, in connection with some other brands? Thank you. Okay, so, um House of Darien um, and, and the Beyoncé show that was hosted at Selfridges, that was a, a, a deal that was really created by the buying department. So when they went out to market and um, they were approached to, to have the clothes on the shop floor, they said they would take the clothes on the condition that Beyoncé came as well because they knew that she would deliver more PR coverage than the clothes were worth, frankly. So sometimes you, you, might, you might buy a collection because it's, it's not necessarily about the product, but it's about something else that it will bring to the business. So um, you, you need to keep an open mind on, on what you buy and why you buy it, um, because uh, you know, that, that's a brand that perhaps has not sustained its, its, um, its fame. She has. She's, she's you know, a phenomenal musician. But um, for the business, it, it delivered huge PR coverage, which was exactly what was needed. For Mr. Armani, he's, um, he's a bit of a specialist in, in, his, in his world. He knows how to market, he knows how to PR, and he knows how to design. And um, he's, he's just got a, a rather you know, alchemic mix um, and has, has also been incredibly fortunate with his timing. So th there isn't a definitive silver bullet, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Um, everyone has to find uh, their own particular route. All right, hello. Hello. Yeah, so um, you've had quite the career moving from one top company to another, from you know Armani to Selfridges, so it's safe to say you're highly sought after. Now, um, how do you maintain a, a working business relationship with your former employers? You know, because it can be quite volatile, you know, maintaining that. Some people just don't want you to go. How do you handle that? Well, that's a very good point, and, and the event here really shows what a small world we live in because I've had the pleasure of reconnecting with Rebecca, who I knew at Selfridges, with Vanessa, who I got to know, funnily enough, when I was at Armani as opposed to Condé Nast, um, and Giles, I've had the pleasure of going to many of his shows um, along with Julian MacDonald, and, um, and who would have thought that you know, GT Bank's Fashion Weekend would be um, the glue that brings, you know, lots of different people together. Um, seriously, I think, um, <laughs> so uh, I think it's important to maintain healthy and friendly uh, relationships with everybody where you go because you never know where they're going to pop up again. And, um, you know, that that rather hopeless intern that was with you for six months may end up being your boss in five years' time, you, you know. So um, I always take the view, be nice to everybody, um, and especially the younger people, because they've got, 
they've got the, the brains and the intel that I certainly don't have in the digital sphere. So um, it's it's not so difficult with Instagram and email. Everybody is you know connected. Um, so. It, it's, it's small as well. You find that the same faces pop up time and time again. You only go to the shows uh, a few seasons and you'll see it's the same people sitting in the front row. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a small world. It's a very small world. Be nice. Be kind. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much. Sorry, this is the only... That was the last question. And Sophie, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. My pleasure. An insightful class. Really, no, thank you. Thank for, you. For You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Please.